Welcome to Public Affairs Public Access on Houston Media Source TV. I'm Gene Preuss with the League of Women Voters of Houston. The middle of February 2021 saw a blistering record winter weather across Texas and Houston with the arrival of Winter Storm Uri. The harsh winter temperatures took several lives across Texas, disrupted much of the state's infrastructure, electrical service, internet, telephone, water delivery, and icy roads also played a role in limiting repairs and restarting lost power to many areas across Houston. Tonight, we'll learn how Northwest Houston was affected. We'll talk to Houston City Council Member Amy Peck from District A to tell us about how winter or weather affected her district. We'll also learn about the state and how it gets its electricity. We'll visit with Manti Cummings of Energia Veleta to discuss the future of wind energy in Texas. And Dr. Gavin Dillingham of Houston's Advanced Research Center, HARC, will talk about energy and the Texas power grid. Before the COVID pandemic, our show was broadcast live, but for the past year, we've been pre-recording our interviews. Tonight's interviews were recorded earlier this week. First, we talked with Houston's District A City Council Member, Amy Peck. With me this evening is Council Member Amy Peck. She's from District A in uh, Northwest uh, Houston uh, in Spring Branch, uh, where I live. And she's my uh, district member, so my district representative. So thank you very much for appearing to be on the show. What did you see during Winter Storm Yuri? Uh, what were some of the problems, some of the, the, the concerns that grew out of, uh, of, of what happened in Houston? Well, first, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. Um, in District A, we saw very similar things to the rest of the city, to the rest of the state. People were without electricity, without water for extended periods of time, myself included. Um, and I think that people weren't as prepared for this as you might be for a hurricane. And so we saw people who who were without water and we were trying to get water to people um, because you know you just don't think that you're gonna be without water for, for a winter storm. So it's something that you know a lot of us have never lived through. And so um, people were without um, necessities for a very long period of time. I, I think, you know, the the weather uh, people had told us, you know, a storm's coming, but, and it's going to be cold, but I don't think anybody anticipated what 20 degrees is. You know, I've lived in other parts of the state and I've been to other places where it was much colder. Right. But, um, but, you know, we, as you're saying, we weren't expecting that we weren't prepared for that here in Houston. Um, <clears throat> have you talked to other members of the council to gauge what, if, um, how they were reacting to it? Yeah, it sounds like in other parts of the city, talking to other council members, people were in very similar situations throughout the city. Um, in District A, it seemed like no one had water, working water in whole neighborhoods. It wasn't, you know, pockets of people who had bursted pipes here or there we were without water in district a and i know other some other districts had similar situations as well um but i think that people just weren't prepared for this storm because you would never expect that the electricity would go out for the entire state of texas no one ever expected that to happen it shouldn't have happened and it, it needs to never happen again well, you know, I uh, I've been trying to educate myself to be to be honest, you know, I had no idea what ERCOT was uh, or, you know, I'd never heard the word before. I don't think uh, the idea of the grid and it uh, I, th I think it was a, a, um, a harsh education for a lot of folks who are trying to find out what exactly happened uh, as far as Houston is concerned. 
uh, and city council, what, from your perspective, are some of the things that maybe we can learn? What are some of the takeaways we, we might learn from the storm? Well, I think for the city of Houston, the, one of the big takeaways for me is to make sure that um, our technology, our equipment, our infrastructure is in place to handle water concerns. So the electricity issue, you know, that's a state <laughs> issue. Of course, it's my concern. Any concern for my constituents becomes my concern. So although, you know, I don't have direct um, jurisdiction, regulatory authority over the electricity. So, but what we do have direct oversight over is the water. And it seemed like there was failure in that system. And the generators, the backup generators, there's still a lot of questions that need to be asked that I will be asking as far as did the city not do enough to weatherize um, and put precautions in place to make sure that this wouldn't happen? Is this just something that no one could have ever expected. I, I have a lot of questions going forward and have asked for a TTI committee um, meeting about this and the chair and vice chair of that committee. They've already been working on that even before I asked for that meeting. So um, there's a lot of questions to be asked about this. So can you tell us what that TTI means? It's the um, Transportation Technology and Infrastructure Committee. Okay, and, and what are they responsible for? So they're responsible for a lot of different things, technology, infrastructure, the um, drinking water operations, which would fall under that committee. So I've asked um, for a committee to kind of go over what happened, what wasn't working, what was working, what can we do in the future to make sure that this doesn't happen again? Because we've seen hurricanes come and go where the entire city didn't lose water like they did in this situation. So we need to make sure that you know, the chances of this happening again anytime soon, probably it won't, but we need to be prepared for anything at this point. I think if the year 2020 has taught us anything is that we need to be prepared for anything and everything to happen um, and make sure that we are ready. Now, you're no stranger to constituent services and reaching out and, and answering. And and I have to compliment you. You were very active on Facebook and the neighborhood Facebook groups uh, responding to concerns and and panicked messages and uh, people upset about not having electricity or not having water and you know you were I, I know your office was taking some of that information in and you were in Brenda Stardig's office when she was council member here so you're no stranger to uh, d dealing with constituents and helping constituents out but were you prepared at all I mean you came into office in January. Uh, of 20 uh, when you were elected and then we had in March a few months later uh, pandemic and then we had other issues as well uh, we had concerns about the election we had uh, a, 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 and then you know we, we're getting vaccines but we have the mask orders people are upset about that and then we have now the uh, problem with the winter storm it seems like there's been a lot of plagues hitting the city of Houston and, and the nation as well. What were some of the, the high points and low points you saw um, that you would like to address in the upcoming uh, years that you're on the, you're on the council? Well, first of all, you're right. It, it has been one thing after another, after another. Um, just first coming into office, we started with a bang, literally. We had the Watson grinding explosion. That was about two weeks after taking office. And it's just been one thing after another, disaster after disaster. Um, but we're, we're dealing with it. I think my background working um, for the previous council member, council member Sardig, has um, prepared me working with constituents, as you said um, earlier. Um, and it's, it's been tough, but what we've been trying to do in the District A office is to focus on those things that when all of this is done, there's still going to be those issues that I ran for in the first place to try to fix infrastructure issues, quality of life crime, those kinds of things that we are trying to solve in District A. And so we are focused on those things and the um, COVID and all of these other things have just added to our list. It hasn't taken away from those those core issues that we're trying to address. Um, we've just added added a lot to our plate right now. 
if if I'm sitting um, in District I, District uh, H, or uh, District C, and I've got issues, um, what can my city representative do? My council member representative, what what should I direct toward their office if I feel that I'm still having problems, not enough water, uh, electricity is still spotty? Um, what what should I do? Well, I would suggest that if anyone has any concerns still, and we are still getting concerns into my office, to please contact us. It might not be under my direct jurisdiction, but we can get you to the right place. So even if it's something that has to do with electricity, if it's something on the state level, we can contact you know your state representatives on your behalf make sure you get connected with them if it's a plumbing issue and you maybe you don't have the funds to pay for it or um you know you just have concerns about it in some way let us help you let us get you connected to the right people we can find organizations most likely that um that can assist you with any kind of concern so while it might not be under my direct jurisdiction we work very hard in the district day office to connect people to the right places. I take my role as being a public servant very seriously. And so it might not be my role, but it's, it's my problem if it's the problem of my constituents. What were some of the bright things you've seen uh, in the past year as a city council member uh, of uh, things that make you proud of what you're doing and, and of the district you represent? I am so proud of district a it has been a tough year for District A. I mean, really for all of Houston, but really for District A as well. And every time something happens, the community comes together and supports each other. And that is District A. That is that is what we do. That's what we've always done, what we continue to do. And I've just seen so many neighbors helping each other, not just with the winter storm, but just in general, even with COVID. Um, helping on social media, helping people find each other jobs and um, resources and just people have really come together to help each other out. We've had so many food distributions, not just from the winter storm, but just because of COVID and just um, water distributions, all kinds of things that people, the community, they've come out to help us with. They have contacted our office. What can we do to help? What can we, what, what volunteer opportunities do you have? We want to give back. And we've seen so many people um, come and support our community. We recently served almost 5,000 meals this past weekend to the community that was with um, Representative Lacey Hull's office as well. She was, um, she helped us so much um, put that together and you know, we served almost 5,000 meals and it wasn't just the two of us. It was so many volunteers who came, neighbors helping each other. It's been, it's been tough, but it's also been really wonderful to see everyone come together. And I've just been so proud of our community. So if there's any need that you have, contact us. We'll find support for you. Um, that's what we're here for. That's what we do. So please contact us, not just in March, but in any month we're here to serve. Well, I really appreciate it. And again, thank you for all the things you did. And, and, and as, as somebody in your uh, district, I was very impressed the, uh, the amount of, of assistance and the visibility you showed. Uh, you were always on our neighborhood Facebook pages. And uh, I know you're not the only council member who does that, but you're uh, the one that I was most concerned about because I live in your district when the power was off. People were saying, contact Amy's office. Uh, because you had you had said, let us know if there's anything we can do. And I really appreciate that. One of the things uh, when I get to interview candidates, uh, one of the things that I'm always impressed with, I know a lot of times people complain about government, but our city uh, and local elected representatives, uh, you know, we, we really get a good batch of people who really want to serve. And I thank you for being one of those people. Well, thank you. I really appreciate that. Um, like I said, I, I take this role as being a public servant very seriously. And I think the way that people are contacting their elected representatives are changing. And that's why we try to use social media as much as possible. And, you know, sometimes we have to ask them to contact our office and get more details on things. But we do try to have a presence there to make sure that anyone knows that they can contact me. Um, and I respond myself on social media. So, um, you know, we're, we're just we're here and we're ready to serve no matter how you contact us. Well, thank you again very much. And, and how do they get in contact with your district office? Uh, what's the best way to do when they have questions and problems? So if anyone needs to contact us, 
you can send us an email district a at houstontx.gov or you can call us 832-393-3010 we're pretty easy to get a hold of you can just google my name find a way to get a hold of us we want to hear from you we're happy to hear from the community so please do contact us Member Peck, thank you very much for your time and thank you for your responsiveness and for all you've uh, done in this uh, last year. Uh, it's really been a, uh, a time that we needed a good city council member, and I thank you for being that person. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Wind energy is a modern spend on an old way of harnessing energy. Tonight, our guest is Monty Cummings of Energia Veleta, who dropped in to discuss wind energy and its future here in the Lone Star State. Okay, Monty Cummings, I want to welcome you to Public Affairs, Public Access on Houston Media Source TV. Thank you very much for being with us. Um, you are with Energia Veleta. That's actually your company that you started. Tell us a little bit about how you got into wind energy. Well, it was about 20 years ago, Gene, and thank you for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here to talk about electricity and renewable energy, Texas and Mexico. Um, as a professional, I'm a CPA, and at one point in time, I had a boutique consulting firm and an oil and gas company, friends and customers of mine, asked me how the production tax credit for renewable energy worked under Section 45D of the Internal Revenue Code. I gave them a brief explanation of how that worked um, along and presented my court, uh, consulting invoice along with it. And they said, tell me more. And we kept talking about it and made a couple of um, uh, presentations to other industry um, leaders who have also been in it. Uh, Texas and natural gas um, and electricity are intricately intertwined, which we will talk about a little bit more in this. And because of their activity in the oil and gas patch, um, we looked at it and decided that developing a wind energy project is very similar to developing an oil and gas prospect in that you lock up a resource rich laden area, uh, get the rights to develop it, get all your uh, permits and uh, um, uh, connect up to the export uh, pipeline as it were, get a customer and generate the energy. So we decided to do that. And our first prospect we started working on in 2003 it was on the Kennedy Ranch, just south of Corpus Christi. It's a, a 400,000 acre ranch um, um, founded by Mifflin Kennedy, the, um, um, uh, the mentor to Richard King and the King Ranch, but this is the Kennedy Ranch. And uh, our first winner developed our first winning energy project. And seven years later, it became operational as the Penisco Wind um, uh, farm project in Kennedy County, Texas. Uh, that was the, how I was introduced in by being a CPA. And at that point in time, um, you know, the, also the Texas um, electrical industry was restructured in 1999 with Senate Bill 2, which divided the energy industry from vertically integrated entities to generation companies, transmission companies, and load serving entities. Um, and because of that, there was a requirement to purchase a certain percentage of renewable energy in order to be a, um, a load serving entity. And that also was a driver of the start of wind energy in Texas, uh, along with the production tax credit and the requirement of retail energy companies to buy a certain percentage of their electricity from renewable sources. So a lot of the the foundation for wind energy and, and why it started expanding is, is based in part on legislative mandate. Uh, correct. Uh, the, the initial portion of it was um, a man. Well, you know, if you want to go back further than that, you know, from the federal level, you know, the, the public utility act um, that required um, uh, load serving entities to buy from any generation source. Um, this was George Bush, um, uh, also, Governor Jerry Brown gave out a, a tax credit um, for California state tax, a federal tax for installed capacity. So yes, the impetus uh, started with governmental incentives to promote the use of renewable energies. And the ones we just mentioned about uh, the, um, um, the, uh, the, the the percentage production requirement in Texas was one that kickstarted 
the energy industry in Texas, as well as the ERCOT open access, um, non-discriminatory access for any generator that wanted to connect to the um, electric grid also facilitated the uptake of um, wind energy um, uh, in the early 2000s. So you're working uh, on developing projects in, in, have developed projects in South Texas yep. um, and in uh, the Pacific uh, with Mexico. When I think of wind energy, I always think of West Texas because my wife's from West Texas. We traveled up there a lot and outside of Big Spring, Sweetwater in that area, there are just rows and rows of windmills. Yep. Um, but wind energy is really all over the place. There, there are uh, mills in, windmills in the Gulf too, right? Well, in the water, no, but on the Texas Gulf Coast is um, what I call, it's the Napa Valley of wind energy. And I can give you some characteristics that, that would do that. You know, no doubt about it, uh, wind energy in Texas started in West Texas, um, out by Fort Davis. Um, uh, some of the original plants uh, started by Abilene, uh, Trent Mesa. Um, the, the part about the panhandle, which is um, um, the windiest part of Texas, um, really didn't take off until there were transmission lines built to bring that energy from the Panhandle Amarillo Lubbock area downstate. Really, the ERCOT grid, transmission grid, used to run about to Roscoe, which is just a little bit northeast of Sweetwater. And um, beyond that, that was all Southwest Power Pool. Um, also out towards um, uh, Fort Stockton, um, um, uh, close to um, uh, um, the Pecos River Valley on um, uh, Woodward Mountain, King Mountain, those were the original Texas renewable energy. Now, what happens is that uh, uh, it's windiest there at the night and in the winter. And when does everybody need energy is during the summer and the afternoon. And that's the good fortune we had living in, in, on the Texas coast. And that's when it's always windy. Every afternoon, it's 15, 20 miles an hour, just because the air above the Chihuahuan Desert heats up and rises up and the cold air from uh, cold in comparison uh, rushes off the Texas Gulf to take the place of that hot air that rises. And that's when we started working on the, this project in Kennedy County, which is right on the Texas Gulf Coast, um, which, um, you know, it's never really too windy, but it, then again, it's never really um, too uh, not windy. So, I mean, it's, it's windy, you know, 300 and, 310 days out of the year and the other 40 or 50, there's not. It blows from the Southeast most of the time. It's sitting on the existing transmission, robust uh, transmission grid that not that far distant from Houston, San Antonio, Austin, Rio Grande Valley, where major load centers are. So, um, and, and there's plenty of wide open flat spaces to uh, put these things. And so South Texas has really come on as and the Texas Gulf Coast area as a important wind. It, it's to um, wind energy, what uh, wine is to Napa Valley, what Georgia is for peaches. I want to confess my ignorance here. I really didn't know that much. I mean, I drove by windmills and I know that Texas Tech has a big wind energy management yep. program, but I and, and, and probably a lot of other people really don't know how wind energy works. I mean, okay. we know it turns turbines like right. hydroelectric, uh, right. but how does energy get into the grid? Okay, well, you know, well, I'll just make this, we'll, we'll step back and talk all about elect, just the generation of electricity in and of itself. There is this process called electromagnetic induction, electromagnetic induction, where you uh, run some metal between a couple of um, uh, magnets and nobody knows why, they just know it does, it generates electricity. Um, and, um, you know, originally these were um, um, gasoline, diesel, um, coal-fired turbines that spun these turbines at a high rate to make electricity. And so with that, you know, um, Al, um, 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 Al Edison, you know, made his uh, power plant in New York City and power uh, became accepted all over, you know, the world. Now with wind energy, it's the same um, there's coal plants, you know, as you mentioned, there's hydroelectric plants that the moving water moves a turbine fast enough to where these magnets start spinning and um, create electricity from the electromagnetic induction. Um, 
Coal plants, which boil water and the steam coming off the water turns the turbine. Same with natural gas plants. Same with nuclear plants. Those are uh, three where they're burner tips, where water boils. People call them thermal generation. Hydroelectric is not um, thermal generation, but um, natural gas, coal, and nuclear are all thermal. Now, the same um, electromagnetic induction um, process happens with the wind energy. As the blades start turning, they run through a gearbox, a planetary gearbox, which takes the revolution of 12, 20 revolutions per minute and runs it up to 3,400 revolutions per minute and creates electricity. The electricity, just like that, once the, the, the electron is in the uh, wire, all right, it's no different than a, an electron from natural gas, nuclear, or any other source. And it gets collected and distributed in the same manner. And it's um, generated by the same electromagnetic induction, um, fueled by the kinetic energy of the wind and these blades catching the wind, spinning it, and then running through a gearbox to make it up to high speed um, uh, turbine electric generation speeds. Now, that's how it works. Um, now, um, unlike um, other thermal, it's, um, it's not as easy to control. You know, it's becoming easier to predict, um, but it's not as, it, it's not, there's no on and off switch. Um, when, it's, it's, it, when it's spinning and generating electricity, you want to take it. And that's the other thing about uh, electricity. It's you make it about the same time you use it. Mm -hmm. There's no really economical way to store electricity at scale. Of course, there's batteries, and we've made great improvements in battery technology for automobiles, um, for cell phones, but enough storage and a battery to power a city, we're just not there yet. Um, and that's where hydroelectric facilities come in. In a sense, they're a battery storage in that when you don't let the water loose, you know, there, there's your storage facility is in hydro. So, and just because of the nature of Texas, if you've driven out to Lubbock, you know, we don't have much water. So there's not going to be, there is hydro, but it's not a significant uh, contributor to the Texas electric grid. So the, you, you had mentioned earlier, and I think you're coming back to this, is that a lot of the energy generation, whether it be nuclear, gas, carbon, water, or solar, it works in a, integratedly, I guess, a, yes. in an integrated method. And, 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 right. and sometimes sun isn't available. Sometimes wind's not available. Um, sometimes water can be stored. And, and, and as you mentioned, there's no batteries. Um, how do you foresee the near future of uh, wind energy contributing? Well, you know, I think we take a look at the... Um, you know, um, knowing your orientation towards history to take a look at where we've come from um, will give you a good idea of where we think we're going to be going. You know, Texas, as it stands right now, if you just want to focus on Texas, is mm, the eighth largest wind. If it were another country, which some people seem like to think it, 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 it could and should be, it would be the eighth largest uh, wind energy um, country in the world. Um, you know, there's U.S., China. I mean, it's up there with uh, Germany, uh, France, Spain. Uh, more and this than, is Texas alone. Texas, if it was another country, has more wind energy than you know 180 other countries. If you, um, it's it's it, it would be the eighth largest wind energy install capacity market in the world. Now that's only going to continue. Why? Because it's the cheapest. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no, the, the only cost you have um, in um, ongoing for um, wind energy is property taxes. You know, all your fuel costs, essentially, same with solar, all your um, fuel costs over the life of the project, you're investing in a capital cost up front. You know, um, you know, I've participated in auction processes competing against any one, any, any uh, generation source, come one, come all. And wind energy and solar are the cheapest forms of energy um, right now. Now, um, that's great, but you know you don't build a system uh, out of completely out of wind energy. To, one of the things that wind energy helped during our recent uh, polar vortex is that the diversity of the ge ge uh, ge ge geography of the, the system, Texas Gulf Coast wind kept contributing a significant amount of energy 
during that whole. Um, so we would have been in worse shape had we not had wind energy. Where we think we're going to go, you know, um, you know, certainly as a switch is made to low carbon sources, wind power will have an increasingly solar. Uh, the, what, what, one of the challenges of wind power is that it doesn't work well at the distributed level, meaning home energy out in the panhandle. They used to have wind chargers back before the Rural Electric um, uh, Act came in, but um, using distributed generation on your home, I think that's going to be a, another area that we're going to need to take a serious look at. Certainly um, increasing um, demand response and winterizing our homes has another role to play um, to reduce the energy. The reason why the energy demand was so high recently in the polar vortex is, is that you know, our homes here in Texas are just not built with the proper insulation to sustain uh, to, to, to survive sub-zero temperatures for days at a time. Um, so, I mean, th yes, th there is um, a patchwork of um, both um, generation resources, transmission upgrades, um, uh, insulation um, of um, our residences and businesses that's all going to contribute into the transition to a lower carbon future, even including electric vehicles. So what, you know, you're mentioning about um, it's not really effective on a individual basis. And I, you know, one, there, there, there's a, a little house that, well, it's a, I think it may be a, a farm that I pass uh, on the way to Lubbock uh, from time to time. And um, I think it's outside of pumpkin center and there's a big, well, not a big, but a, a good sized windmill. Uh, mm -hmm. out there, uh, kind of like the ones behind you. And okay. I guess it powers their business or their home. Yep. But um, as you're saying, it's not good. Um, it's not cost effective for just an individual, right? Well, you know, um, there, I can give you examples of um, school districts that have put wind turbines at their facilities, um, shallow water um, school district um, by Abilene. There's another one. And, you know, it's good for um, generating the cheapest amount of energy, you know, when it's windy. Now, whether that's going to be 100% of your energy usage, no, you're going to have to have to supplement it with uh, solar. You're going to have to have to supplement it with natural gas. You're going to have to, so it's going to take a balanced um, portfolio of generation to not only provide for the cheapest energy, but also reliable energy and cheap and reliable many times are at um, uh, opposition. You know, that's one of the problems with the Texas grid we recently experienced. Texas is great for making cheap energy. It's the cheap energy capital of North America. Now you want cheap natural gas? We got it. You want cheap wind? We got it. One of the reasons why is that the increased capital requirements needed to winterize or weatherize wind turbines, gas pipelines, coal-fired plants, nuclear fire plants were not made in the interest of keeping the energy cheap. Now, as a result, we have a Harvey-like you know, catastrophe with the, the cascading failure of natural gas pipelines, gas um, uh, generation facilities, wind turbines, nuclear facilities, water pumping stations that run off of electricity. All of those combined, you know, people are saying this, the after effects of the polar vortex freeze is going to be more costly than Hurricane Harvey. So it's kind of a, you know, you, you want to pay me now, you want to pay me later. You know, we didn't do the pay me now on requiring wind turbines to have the de-icing package. We didn't um, require the installation of wellhead freeze protections. Uh, that, that's where a lot of the natural gas got froze up is because the water comes up with the natural gas and freeze and doesn't run down the pipeline. Mm -hmm. You know, we didn't require um, heating controls on uh, feeder systems of the nuclear power plant. You know, it was cloudy and there was no sun. Um, and everybody didn't have a um, um, their home insulated and had to turn the heating the way up and we had the crash. So, and now we're going to be paying the bill for not making those investments on the front end. So, you know, it was kind of a, 
uh, a planning decision as in the interest of making the cheapest energy possible, which we were great at. And Texas, had, you know, benefited greatly from industry growth, job creation, from having the cheapest energy. But now we're paying the price with the catastrophe, catastrophic fallout from the cascading failure of systems um, as a result of the polar vortex. You bring up some issues um, in, in the discussion, and it reminds me of a lot of things that I see and hear on social media or from people who are talking about wind energy. Um, it, it is cheap, but let me ask you. Let me ask you the the question that I see all the time: How many birds do these windmills <laughs> kill? Much less than all the hunters in Texas combined. Okay, <laughs> um, you know, um, I've worked on this particular issue for more than twenty years. Our first wind energy facility was in um, along Baffin Bay, along the Laguna Madre, um, which is on the central flyway and at a choke point on the central flyway of all the migratory birds that come from central U.S., can't east coast U.S. and winter in uh, the tropics um, and are on the winter flyway on the way back. So we, uh, 80% of uh, North American redhead ducks overwinters along the Laguna Madre. So um, in order to respond to that concern, you know, we mounted one of the most ambitious um, pre-construction avian mortality monitoring programs. We use radar we used recording devices, uh, um, hundreds of hours of, of biologists in the field, and using their field collected data and um, observation records, applying the biostatistical techniques uh, used there, they came up with the estimate that the wind farm in Kennedy County would kill two point some odd birds per year per turbine. And there are 300 turbines there. so there would be 600 bird deaths um, because of that. Now, as a um, uh, follow on to that, we went on and continued a post-construction mortality monitoring program, um, which actually took the predictions and compared it to the actual results. One of the innovations being Texas that we, uh, usually that field work is done by biologists. So they go out and look for bird carcasses around the bottom of the turbines. And so, <laughs> and um, we found that bird dogs um, are much more reliable than biologists in finding uh, uh, bird carcasses. You know, and, and the, there's certain techniques of um, measuring predation um, and searcher efficiency. That's where the, the bird dogs, because um, we would go out and seed them and, and you know that, um, you know, that there, there's a dead bird there. And did the biologist find it? No, did the bird dog find it? Yes. And the results of that almost mirrored the projections. Certainly, there are areas where, um, um, you know, there are species of concern. The prairie chicken up in, in, in the uh, central flyway is one of concern. The, 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 the bad rap, shall we say, started in California in um, um, Hawthorne and the Tehachapi area, where as wind energy first started out, the towers were lattice work towers and the turbines were of a small capacity, meaning that they, the blades rotated at a very, very high speed. Um, the golden condor native to the area thought those lattice work towers um, for, um, that the turbines were uh, placed upon were a great place to make a nest. And as they're sitting there watching the rabbit run below the wind turbine, they take off and get hit by that blade that's uh, spinning 300 revolutions per minute. Um, so, I mean, there are certain areas that um, you know, need to have extra um, uh, precautions um, and develop it in a responsible way. And I think at least in our Kennedy County, which is the absolute most sensitive area we've ever developed a wind project, and I've done more than my share, um, is, um, is a, a shiny example of um, how you can do responsible. We also installed there um, a radar detection unit, a Merlin radar detection unit, much like they have at uh, airports, um, because uh, jet engines and airports have the same effect on um, um, flying mammals, as they say. 
and as um, a um, incident or a flock of birds is detected on the radar units, they shut the uh, turbines down. Um, bats is also an area of concern, um, and it's found it, it's, it's that that that's really not an impact issue. That's more of a um, um, low pressure issue, in that um, they're. Uh, um, they're, they're, they'll fly into a low pressure and it'll, 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 their, their heads will explode. Now, um, the, uh, so, so I really don't, so, so birds um, is something that you need to take into consideration. You need to do your due diligence. And if you prepare the proper amount of studies and show that you're not going to have any um, um, negative impacts, well then go right ahead. And we, and, and that's what we did. That's how uh, our pioneering, pioneering work, there was a, um, followed by many other people to establish the other wind farms that are along the Texas Gulf Coast. What do you see on the horizons, um, changes that are gonna come about as a result of uh, Winter Storm Uri? Okay, well, you know, first of all, um, on a broader perspective, I would think that, you know, we would need to anticipate that the, the Texas grid has been designed for extreme heat events. Um, and you know, was not designed for extreme cold events. I would think that that needs to be brought into the planning and consideration of it. And that includes additional investment to, um, um, to allow for those types of resources to be more available when we need them, which will require investment. Um, so the first thing is, is to recognize that climate change is upon us now. We're seeing the effects of it and that, um, you know, denial of that um, was only going to continue our path down, um, <laughs> repeat the, 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 the mistakes in planning we made this go around. You know, communication is another one. Certainly when Hurricane Harvey started scraping up the Texas coast, you know, um, every emergency management office, every elected official, every county judge were beaming out um, warnings of, um, what's going to be coming, prepare yourselves, fill up your bathtub, get your like, you know, and in this, I mean, you know, everybody was, you know, happy, happy Valentine's day and the lights went out, you know, there was certainly no coordinated pre uh, preview emergency management notification of this. So that's certainly another area. Um, and figuring out adjustments to the electric market to allow for recovery of investment in these winterization um, 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 uh, necessities in order to survive um, uh, completely. Another, um, thank you for putting in Yuri. That, that even sounds Russian. It's almost, <laughs> Yuri, well, the Yuri Zhivago, right? I mean, it, it, it's, it's fitting. I mean, Dr. Zhivago was filmed in the, the cold and so were we. <laughs> um, you know, um, so certainly market structures, um, other markets have a capacity payment where um, generators are paid just to be ready. And if they're not ready, there's a severe penalty. Um, so the energy that needs to be looked at. Um, uh, so those would be the, the, the three things that I would, uh, would suggest. One is to uh, um, integrate climate change into the planning horizon. Um, uh, second, um, you know, have, um, you know, um, governmental entities be more aware of this and allow for market reforms in order for the investment uh, to, um, to in capital costs to winterize um, all forms of energy, you know, coal piles froze over. Um, nuclear plant, uh, one of our four nuclear plants that is shut down because of one of the water feed system controls froze up. So, um, you know, wind energy certainly um, uh, could have done better but so could have everybody else. And that's where we need to focus on what can we do better to do this? And let's don't get caught um, with this being unexpected and let the public know what's going on. And your program here is a vital step in um, um, educating folks, bring, uh, uh, keeping the discussion going um, as to what we need to do to um, have a carbon-free grid, as well as provide the reliability that we need for an ever increasing dependence upon electricity that our modern society has. Thank you very much. And uh, I appreciate you taking time to visit with us. My pleasure, Gene. Que le vaya muy bien y muchas gracias.
Nice. Our final guest tonight is Dr. Gavin Dillingham with the Houston Advanced Research Center, HARC. And we'll ask him about clean energy and energy diversification in Texas. Well, tell us a little bit about that organization and, and what you do there. Sure. So the uh, HARC, uh, Houston Advanced Research Center, was founded in 1982. Um, George Mitchell founded it as he was uh, starting up the Woodlands. He wanted to create um, kind of a, a research hub up in the Woodlands and really wanted to have a focus on sustainability around that. Um, he, uh, so he, he started uh, HARC at that point. And at that time, we focused a lot more on kind of hard sciences and engineering. Um, we actually housed um, some of the scientists who were working on the, the super collider up around Waxahachie. Um, had a fuel cell lab, um, did all sorts of just kind of highly technical R&D kind of work. Um, over the last, oh, starting about 2000 or so, HARC switched to much more of an environmental and sustainability kind of focus. And since then, has been working on air, energy, and water issues. So we have folks that focus on, you know, scientists that focus on air quality, uh, water scientists focusing on water, water availability, water quality, they do a lot of work in the Gulf Coast, um, and then just kind of the surrounding counties um, dealing in those issues, as well as with ecosystem services. Um, and also, and especially in the last few years, focusing more on stormwater management, uh, flood risk mitigation type work. Um, our, I, I lead the, the clean energy group, so I direct that group, and there's a number of us there. And we focus on a, both the kind of energy efficiency work, as well as grid resilience. Um, distributed energy resources. A lot of our work right now is, is with the Department of Energy, where we do uh, run about three programs now with them, providing technical assistance for things such as uh, microgrids, um, developing different types of decision tools, um, looking at solar plus storage in low-income communities and trying to figure out business models around that. Um, but we do, you know, a good bit of work just kind of in both the um, energy efficiency and resilience space. Um, we also work with um, cities and counties on uh, climate action planning type stuff. So we've, we've put together a few of those and helped the city launch their, um, and actually wrote the city of Houston's climate action plan for them there. So across a variety of different uh, sustainability and, and climate uh, focused areas at this time. These questions uh, about clean air, about, um, energy, about stormwater, and about uh, how Houston and other growing areas uh, are going to deal with that become more and more important to the public at large. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And, and we're seeing a significant trend in that area as far as, um, you know, just, you know, I, and I think, you know, we're, we're seeing it both from the, you know, from just residents as well as uh, organizations, companies, corporations within the, within the region. You know, after Hurricane Harvey, there was, you know, much of that recovery had to happen, but there was also a lot of question of what do we need to do with our infrastructure to improve its resilience, to reduce the likelihood of flooding? Because for some companies, or, you know, especially these, some of these large <clears throat> global energy companies, there, you know, there was discussions about concerns about recruiting and recruiting and retaining, you know, high quality, you know, um, knowledge workers and kind of recruiting uh, younger workers to come work in the industry and such. And so, you know, there's very much, you know, as we're seeing, you know, changes in uh, <clears throat> the number of events and the intensity of events, if it's hurricanes or flooding or extreme heat or those types of issues. Um, th there's very much a growing um, interest in that regard of how do we mitigate that risk and make Houston a, and the region in general just you know, improve its quality of life, make sure it's, you know, it has you know, that sustainability associated with it, make sure it's an attractive place to come and live and, and work and such. And so, yeah, it's, it's very much on, on people's minds and it's very much how do we start you know, continuing to deal with these um, ongoing you know, extreme weather events that seem to be happening on a more regular basis. There's ways in which we can reduce that and how do we start putting the, the investment in place to do that. Well, one of the weather events that on, is on everybody's mind right now is um, the question of, trop of of a winter storm URI. And, um, you know, we're just recovering from that. People are getting their electricity back. Um, and people are asking questions. The legislature has met recently to look into the energy grid ERCOT. Can you inform, like most people, I think, 
a lot of this is new information to us and we don't know, you know, what we're hearing. We may not understand it fully. So can you explain a little bit about ERCOT and, and what that is and how it was formed? Sure. So, so ERCOT is what's called an independent system operator. And it's a quasi-governmental organization that was formed by the Public Utility Commission of Texas. And their primary goal is to schedule electricity to come onto the grid and to get it to the right locations. So they're, they're largely a, a scheduler in that regard. Um, they, they do go out and make sure that, you know, that energy or the generators are producing the power they need to produce, making sure there's enough power on the grid and then making sure it gets routed to the right locations and such. But they're a, one piece of a very, very, you know, kind of large system here. Um, so that, you know, you have, the, you have the state, you know, the governor and the legislature, they largely put together the rules that goes down to the Public Utility Commission of Texas. The PUC then puts together, you know, they, they work on the implementation of some of those rules, as well as, you know, continue to add to them or, or make the, you know, appropriate regulatory changes and stuff. And then ERCOT, you know, reports to the Public Utility Commission there. Um, and, and ERCOT works pretty pretty much with a large ecosystem of different types of, of companies out there, especially when you look at ERCOT within the deregulated market context. And so within the state of Texas, you have, you have uh, part of the market's regulated, part of it's deregulated. ERCOT's responsible for the deregulated part of the, st part of the state. And that's about 85 to 90% of the electricity use in the state. The other non or the other regulated sections would be uh, actually in the woodlands, uh, kind of the northern part of the woodlands, uh, is, is, which is Intergy. Um, Austin has Austin Energy. There's CPS in San Antonio, and then there's El Paso Electric in, in El Paso. Those are all regulated and, and have a, little, a bit different rules. Um, some of them still inter interact in the ERCOT market, but it's, it's slightly different. So ERCOT is largely responsible for the deregulated market there. They work what's called uh, transmission distribution utilities. Those are like your center points for your Encore or your AEPs that are out there. And their responsibility is just the transmission distribution system. They get their power from the, from the generators or, that are out there. The generators are independent power producers. Um, they're, they're large, you know, organizations such as Vistra or, or NRG or Calpine or, you know, you, you know, both on the, on the thermoelectric side or is on the wind and um, solar side of things, large utility scale systems. And, they're, and so they're, they're those generators produce the power that gets placed on the transmission distribution grid. The transmission distribution utilities get the power to the customers. And then also in the reg deregulated market, you have the retail electricity providers. They're the one that's buying the power on behalf of the customer. And they're, they're, they're kind of that, that liaison within that. So you have a lot of different pieces and parts working together in this regard. And there's actually, you can dive deeper into that of other entities, but at the high level, kind of the different pieces that are, that are going on, on in that market. So uh, with the League of Women Voters in this show, what we try to do is educate the public uh, to, so that we can be better informed voters. And one of the things that I've seen recently is a lot of finger pointing. Um, and so let me ask you, as someone who studies this, what got us in trouble during tropic during winter storm Yuri? What it's you know I'm not used to saying winter storm here in in Houston. Uh, right, right. What what got us into it to the point where we were? Right, it's a great. I, I keep calling it tropical storm or hurricane too. I mean because we're so used to those versus winter storms. It was right. such a <laughs> um, so so yeah. It's you know it's kind of the nature of the of the market that we're in right here it's the the, the ERCOT market or just the deregulated market is very much focused on providing the lowest cost energy and what that means is that there's a focus on the lowest cost energy being provided to the grid and reliability and that works great whenever there's blue sky conditions and everything's you know kind of within your conditions of operation there um, it's not a grid that's designed for a tremendous amount of, of resilience. And that is just based on the nature of how the market was designed. There's no incentive necessarily to do what people have been talking about as far as the winterization or the weatherization of the, of the grid here. And the reason for that is any kind of major changes you make to these to if it's a wind turbine or if it's a natural gas plant or a coal plant or nuclear or solar, any kind of winterization or weatherization you do adds cost to that. And it makes them less competitive in the market. 
So there's no incentive necessarily to, to, to add these types of components to, to, uh, to any kind of generator there. There's also aren't any resilient standards put in place and that would be the Public Utility Commission that would have to come up with the resilient standards and enforce those. Those standards aren't, aren't, aren't put in place either because they just, once again, it adds to cost to, to the market, to the ability to produce this power at the cheapest rate. And it's, and it's wonderful, you know, and, and Texas, you know, sells its stuff on low, de low regulations and low cost of energy. And that works out wonderfully until you have these types of events hit, hit us. And that starts showing the vulnerability of that type of approach. And so there needs to be, you know, efforts made, and th that's where this discussion is going right now, of how do you incentivize some of this weatherization and winterization to happen within these plants in order to re reduce the likelihood of this happening. And a lot of that really depends on, on, some, on some of the trade-offs. The grid is largely developed, the ERCOT system or just Texas system in general is developed to deal with extreme heat, deal with hot summer temperatures. That's what we typically find. And so the natural gas plants are not stick, stuck within a structure. They're not housed in any way, they're out in the open and that's largely to help them on the cooling with cooling. You add any kind of technology to the wind turbines that potentially could make them, you know, be able to sustain, you know, very cold temperatures, but it may make them less efficient during during this uh, during the hot summer periods and such. And so you're dealing with that trade-off and and with that balance there. And so one of the one of the other issues that that we see is that you know when you look at the the long-term system assessment, which is kind of the planning that ERCOT does to look at you know what what does future demand and what does future generation look like. Um, across the state. And this is, you know, this is what happens with what's called integrated resource planning in other states or just, you know, energy planning in general, is that traditionally they look at historical weather data. So they look back 20 years. Okay, this is 20 years of what the, a pattern of, of weather patterns here. And they projected ahead 20 years. And they said, okay, we're assuming that the weather is going to continue to look like this. We'll throw some contingencies in there. We'll say, oh, what if there's a 2011 drought or whatever is this and whatever is that? And how will the system perform in that regard? What we're seeing now and what we study at, at HARC, and we have a few scientists working on this, is, is more looking at downscaled climate data. So we're looking at these, these grids, this very granular data that can look at about a seven kilometer by seven kilometer type, type grid here. And this has been working with actually with Texas Tech um, Climate, uh, climate Sciences Center uh, to get this data. And we're looking at, okay, so we, we really know that, you know, previous weather patterns are not gonna be, you know, reflected in future weather patterns. That we're, we're pretty certain on what that looks like. And the trends are showing that direction. We're seeing a lot more intensity of these types of events, whether it's hurricanes or flooding or drought or extreme heat, we're seeing that, that tendency there. So we know that we need to look at different types of data. And so we're starting to look at these climate models more closely and looking at the impacts on the, on the power generation systems. So if you have a natural gas plant or a coal plant, and some of the biggest concerns in Texas, although a lot of the discussions around winter, um, the winter, um, winter storm Uri, is really more on extreme heat and water availability and water temperature to cool these thermoelectric power plants and can allow them to operate over time. And so now we can start using this, this downscale climate data and say, okay, so out in the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years, this is the likelihood that we're going to be seeing a drought or we're going to be seeing this extreme heat event. And this is how intense and potentially how long lasting it's going to last. So it allows, allows these planners to start running scenarios, allows them to kind of see, okay, what are my options under these different scenarios and make decisions based on that. Right now, we don't have, none of that is happening within, within ERCOT at all. And you end up developing your system and developing your plants and your market in a way that does not take into account any of that, any of that future risk. And that becomes problematic, um, especially as we see these, these changing um, uh, weather events and weather patterns. Well, Dr. Gavin Dillingham, I want to thank you very much for your time and for your uh, thought-provoking responses. I mean, giving us a lot to think about. Oh, absolutely. It's wonderful talking with you today. So thank you, Gene. Thank you. I want to thank our special guests on tonight's show, Houston City Council Member Amy Peck, Monty Cummings of Energia Valletta, and Harks, Dr. Gavin Dillingham, for telling us about how the city fared during the recent winter storm uh, and about the future of energy here in Texas. And a big thank you to you for joining us tonight on Public Affairs Public Access Show on Houston Media Source TV. I'm Gene Preuss for the Houston League of Women Voters. Have a good evening.